So if I move forward, first of all, I need to acknowledge Mr. Lin, who is not here with us today because his wife has gone to labor overnight. So we have to, uh, he has apologized to come in. So he was here, supposed to be here today. So I will remove that. Obviously, we have heard sleep is the most common. I will not go through the advantages as we need to rush through. I'm just going to deal with how we avoid complications in Homerton. As you have heard from Kalpana, we have very low risk of complications in this hospital. We don't know why, but we do have some tricks which we do routinely for all patients. So we're going to touch upon hemorrhage, glee, stenosis, and reflux. Hemorrhage is incidence is in the literature is up to 6%, though there has been some old studies showing up to 16%. Sources could be inside the lumen or it could be outside the lumen. Technical factors, obviously we know surgical techniques. We have two different staplers. One bleeds more than the other. We, I'm sure we are all aware, if you use a black, they bleed more. If you use green, less, and blue or white bleeds less. Length of tissue compression, standard is 20 seconds, though some people can do up to two minutes. Stable and reinforcement, I think we have discussed this before. I will just go through briefly overseeing or buttressing or none. Obviously, we in Homerton do no reinforcement at all. Leak, uh, I'm just going to look at the, again, similar percentage, 1 to 6%, though recent case series, as we have gained increase, as what Kalpana has said, we that less experience is less than 1%. 90% happen at the top end of the stomach. It is a high pressure system and it's a compromised vascular supply. Surgical technique, that's where my thing will come in the end. Size of the bougie, what size we use, 30, 32, 34, 36, or 40 French or even higher bougie, and reinforcement that can prevent a leak. So I will not go through these things, but, but there are three reinforcements. There's stitches or running sutures, the least costly. Again, the studies are not showing that overseeing the shape <coughs> during sleep gastronomy does not decrease the risk. If you look at this, does not reduce the incidence of bleeding as well. Buttressing, I will, not, I will skip through these slides. I think we have gone through the burst pressure as well. Uh, I will just go through three meta-analyses. This one, I think one of my colleagues did so, so no benefit of buttressing. If you look at another study, they saw the leak rate in sleeve was significantly lower using absorbable buttressing rather than overseeing bovine strips or no reinforcement. So there is conflicting results. Again, this meta-analysis showed uh, staple line reinforcement significantly reduce the likelihood of slave, uh, staple line leakage with a biologic mat mattress. Uh, I think Kalpana has showed this one that, in fact, that study showed a higher leak rate, though they did so lower bleed rates. Again, hemorrhage, what's the incidence of buttressing and hemorrhage? Definitely, I think there is this general tendency that reinforcement does reduce bleeding generally. So, if we go with what we said earlier on, Several studies have confirmed that reinforcement reduces intraoperative bleeding, as we have agreed, but the difference is not significant. It's hardly less than 100 ml. Is the question, is it worth spending 1,000 euros or in dollars or in pounds to reduce that bleeding? For staple line leakage, while there is some evidence to show that reinforcement reduces staple line leak, but proving that this intervention decreases leakage is extremely challenging. And the reason is that the leak rate is so low that powering a study is very difficult. <coughs> However, there is an argument, which I think Sanjay did put it through, that the cost of a leak can be very high in terms of treating its complications. Therefore, the additional cost for the use of buttressing may be justified. But I will leave that decision to yourselves. Uh, Bougie side, there is some, uh, I think, ar agreement among all of this that we should use a higher size bougie. Uh, with this meta-analysis showing bougie more than 40 French does reduce the leak. And another study, uh, this MBSAQIP study did so the same thing. 38 bougie or higher does significantly reduce leak rate. So I think there is generally agreement that the higher the bougie, the less the chances of a leak. Uh, sleep stenosis is one cause of a leak, usually at the level in Cisera, which I think is the most important thing to prevent a leak. and and. Sometimes we don't place the bougie at the, while stapling the insula, and that should not happen. Functional stenosis is something, again, which we can avoid. I will not go through the types. One is a localized twist, one is a spiral course through the whole lumen of the sleeve. Reflux, we have just heard the debate. It's multifactorial, it's controversial, uh, but hiatus hernia is a risk factor, which is very common, and as we, my colleague has said, we should be repairing it, uh, but let's see. So my experience has been there for the last 9-10 years since I've been here in this hospital. Of, this is an old study, uh, finished in February this year, 400 patients. Uh, 
middle age 43 years, predominantly females, BMI uh, ranging from 32 to 82 with the average BMI of 47, ASA graded 2 and OSA MRS of B. We, I had almost a total of 15 complications that includes readmissions and reoperations, so making a percentage of 3.72%. If you look at bleeding, I just had two patients with bleed uh, which required laparoscopy and was out. There was some drop in hemoglobin in some more patients, but we didn't look into that because there was probably hemodilution. If you look at stepan line leak, I have been lucky so far. I may have a leak next week, but we haven't had or I haven't had a leak so far, just like Sanjay said, he didn't have a leak. However, we had one patient who had a thermal injury and that's the only patient which we did in my 400 with the energized student with a bipolar. I don't need the company because they are here, uh, but with a bipolar component. And that does because the, both the blades are hot. They do cause damage if you're not careful. Probably it's a learning curve. I use that one single, the trust wanted to use that instrument for us. It was cheaper to them and we used it and that caused a leak. Uh, and the posterior wall of the fundus. Chest infection, I had four infections in my last 10 years. Uh, two patients came back with abdominal pain and we did a diagnostic laparoscopy where they were both normal. Four patients had dysphagia, but again, normal investigation. They went home the next day and one patient had chest pain with a normal echocardiogram post-op. We haven't had any conversion to open surgery. We had no inpatient deaths. Uh, just like this, one slide of classification between minor and major with Cleveland Dindo, 10 with minor and 5 with major, but we have all described before already. So why do we have such a low list in Homerton? Probably standardization is what I feel is the best. And we have discussed that before. Standardization is the technique, is the, is the key. Everyone who is doing the fellow, trainee, surgeon should do the same step every time again and again. What do we do to avoid hemorrhage? One thing which I have learned early on, what I feel that, uh, I will just go through the bleeding. Bleeding is when most of the bleed we have noticed is from the greater curve arcade, the great, uh, right and left castrate fluid. And what we do, or what I do at least, we put lots of bleeding or lots of, through the energized instruments, we interrupt the arcade throughout from the top to the bottom. And I feel that does reduce the bleeding or maybe that's the reason why we have less bleeding. I'm sure most of us do a hemostatic test. We raise the blood pressure at the end of the operation before the patient extubated <laughs> up to 140 millimeter mercury and that does see any staple line bleed and that will, we can put extra clips on what I call is a hedgehog stable. Now, one, some of my colleagues may not like it, but if we have to go back to do a bypass, you have to remove one or two of these clips where you're going to staple it. But this does reduce the bleed, especially the smaller bleeds, which just causes a drop in hemoglobin, but not really laparoscopy. Uh, Awardance of leak, the tips, we must use standardized selection of cases from the top to the bottom. Most importantly, we should not angulate in the first two staple firing, but that's the way the incisor comes. Final stapling has to be one centimeter away from the OG junction. Myth, we should all do methylene blue dye leak test because it's a very small leak, but you can see, and that will avoid you coming back the next day or the first night after surgery. Selection, I always use the first firing as a black. The second and third is usually purple, but it can vary depending on the thickness or the male or the female patient. And the, all the subsequent firings are either gold or tan, depending on the which company staplers you're using it. Uh, Gastric stenosis, as I said, we should use the first and second stapler, make it keep it straight, uh, and that will reduce, and that does mean losing one stapler or wasting one stapler, because the second stapler you end up not using the whole length, you have to cross fire across that first stapler. But that does uh, reduce the stricture. Every successive stapler firing should be performed along the same staple line. Equilateral, that's what will avoid functional stenosis. The assistant on the left side must hold the stomach and lateral traction has to be along the greater curvature, so there is no anterior or posterior wall pull by the assistant. And that there should be avoiding excessive lateral traction, otherwise that will cause narrowing of the stomach as well. Reflux, I think uh, already said, we must look into the hiatus. Even if it's a small dimple, we must dissect circumferentially the anterior to right and left crura and, uh, and fix it. But, but if there is a big hiatus only or a moderate side, we should not hit it either to a bypass if the patient is consented, or just abandon the operation. We should not just proceed and do so because they will have reflux post-op. Uh, we should carefully dissect the angle of it, maintaining safe distance from geo junction, but we shouldn't av uh, avoid the sling fibers to avoid a, uh, avoid a reflux. And the regular sleep, again, again, mid-stomach stenosis is the most important thing to avoid reflux as well. Uh, complete fundus mobilization, as we have said, is very important. 
uh, methylene blue light is, I think, it should be done for every patient. I think that's very difficult. I do medical legal reports, and I see if there's no one, somebody has not done methylene blue light test, I, that something goes against that report. We, I normally do drain for every patient from the last 10 years, and that I learned from Dr. Dilemans when I was there with him. He used to put drains for every patient, whether it was bypass or a sleeve, and I have just carried on with that. Though I was with Dr. Uh, Mr. Uh, in Taunton, and but he never used to put a drain there. Uh, I never mm -hmm. used to play any enforcement in my life, and I don't think I will restart, even if Sanjay wants to convince me. And definitely, uh, caution, avoid bipolar unless you are already trained for it. Uh, sorry, we've gone. Uh, one other thing, we do have a very consistent post operative protocol for all patients. And we say three weeks of free fluid with straw. We normally emphasize straw for three weeks. And that's something which I think does gives the patient in their head that you must drink and not take anything because it's very easy to gulp things and if we gulp things then you will have a leak because there could be a higher burst pressure inside and we call it everything there's some urophagia but that can be ta tackled in the first few weeks after three weeks the second next two weeks will be fully diet and the next two weeks will be semi-solid and the last two weeks will be solid we again have follow five p criteria for discharge for the trainees so that just helps them then they will not ring me Pain, there's no pain except paracetamol. Pulse is as a 90. Because they put a drain so that the drain is hemocerous. That's fine. Amount is not relevant. Is the color blue or green? Blue is a dye, green is a bile. CRP must be uh, falling at least less than 100. And they have past flatus. If the flatus is there, that means they don't have a leak because they will have either a collection or nothing. So, great attention to detail. That's for the trainees here who are here, not for the big surgeons. Meticulous surgical technique is very important to avoid and standardization is the key. I'm afraid if you do the same thing for every patient, you will not have a problem with the sleep. Thank you very much. I think you're right, Jack. I think in a male patient, it's very difficult. And, and I try not to rush the cardiac part of fat unless it's very big encroaching. Then I will just reflect it. Otherwise, I'll just go lateral to the uh, cardiac part of fat. But because the cardiac part of fat is very important in the vascular supply. I think there is a tiny blood vessel that keeps the blood supply that dogs here. I think we should avoid dissecting the cardiac part of fat, at least anteriorly. Posteriorly, we must dissect everything <coughs> to avoid a fundus there. Rui. Rui. I, if it's important to go I do both ways. I keep it very pragmatic. If in a male patient, it's very difficult to go all the way lateral to the top. So what I do, I do halfway and then go medially, staple it, and then tackle the top salt gastric in the end once we have divided the whole stomach. Okay. Uh, though I keep it both ways because if you do try to do the whole posterior uh, laterally first in the end, you will end up with a hematoma on the la on the top salt gastric, especially in a male patient. So I do mix, I do both depending on the patient. <laughs> um, Sanjay, I totally agree with you about standardization, and I don't know how many surgeons would be willing to do this in the audience, but we've started to try and measure that uh, digitally with all the laparoscopic videos. So how are you um, at Homerton uh, checking that your standardization is true? Do you look back on the video data? Do you look at any radiology, endoscopy, how do you know that your sleeves are truly standardized? Because I think you're onto a winner here, 
and we're trying to look into this, but how do you prove that your sleeves are actually standardized across all of your colleagues? What I can say, we definitely we don't record sleeves, that is not in my list, uh, but what I'm always there when the trainee is there, I just hold the camera or sit there behind him, and I doesn't let him do anything unless it's what I do in the same steps every time, and they know immediately in the first week or two when they come back to us, that that's the way we have to do it. Uh, yeah. If you or anyone else is interested, we are starting part of a massive multi-center study, if anyone is uh, routinely recording their sleeve gastrectomies, bypasses, minis, revisions, and you want it to be analyzed by machine learning and AI, please drop me a line. That would be a good, great thing. I think there's a stalls as well, I understand. Thank you, Sanjay, a very nice presentation. Now, with regards to the blue dye test, um, with the leak test, have you ever uh, seen a leak? I don't know how many of the surgeons in this audience do a blue dye test on a regular basis, on routine basis on their sleeves? Yeah. Yeah. Majority. Have you ever seen a, a leak? Have you in these four? Uh, not in my experience, no, but, but I still do it and I still keep doing it. But that's one thing which I don't want to come back the same night or the next night just because there is a staple line somewhere leak. But the blue dye test will tell you straight away if there's a technical fault at the time of stapling for a leak. Obviously, there can be ischemic cause of a leak, which can develop five days later, but that won't be because of the you have missed it on the first night or the first day. Thank you. Sanjay, you have slept well for over 400 patients. So far. Thank you. 400. I mean, for a leak, I mean if yes, this was an audit, if, you know, this is a terrific audit. You should stop doing the leak test and you should stop leaving drains. That's they have not helped your clinical management yeah. in one single case. That's it. Jury is still out. Okay. <laughs> with, with that test, we can, we can check the shape of the pouch and the pressure. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. We can see, see the sleeve, uh, how does it look like. <coughs> so that, that, I, mean, that is I, I agree with, with Bruno. And Thanks for the fantastic details you share with us. I think you know, the leak test, I agree with you. I think it's important from a medical legal perspective to make sure you don't have a, a, a device failure or you didn't make a hole somewhere with your, with, your, with your ultrasonic device. With such a low rate of leaks and bleedings, I think you can ditch the drain. Save money, ditch the drain. Yeah, Sanjay, there are many colleagues amongst the audience who, have, who are doing the cardiac, uh, dissection of the cardiac pad of fats and there are many who are not doing. What's your impression about doing and not doing that? Uh, I think it's very important, you know, to don't leave uh, any fungus behind. If you don't dissect it, it's in the very obvious patient. If you don't do that, you are leaving there a cancer on you. I think it's mandatory to do that. Except if the patient is truly in some problem, they don't deserve to play the test. Yeah. So if the patient is a obese patient, you know, you have to have that there, you have to leave it up. In the end, so be sure that you don't leave any fungus behind it. Yeah. That's why it's very important to dissect posteriorly. Not anteriorly. Anteriorly as well. Anteriorly. You know, you can see this centimeter that Jack asked you. If you do leave it up. Not three centimeters, probably a centimeter of fungus. You, you can use this fat for performing the what you know, Cover. The stitches are very really important and why it comes on. You know, They do fire on the top of each other, so I don't think there is a problem with firing. Even they go across it, I don't think it will fire. Are you worried what is the misfire? No, the problem is if, if you, you don't cross it, if you don't cross it, then there is a risk you may have a leak between the two staple lines, between the two junk two cartridges. Yeah. You don't need a mattress if you just stay straight on the line, because there is some evidence that if you're going to cross them, you should. Uh, But you're crossing only in, in Sisura. You're not crossing on the top. No, we're not crossing. Not crossing. 
What is the exact that's, What is the exact size of the buji, Sanjay? You are using in your cases of these 400 cases uh, you have done. In my trust, we have only 30 French buji. We have recently have going have a 34 now, but we haven't have 38 or 40. So I, I have been still using 30 or 34. 90 percent of my cases have been done with 30 buji. But I think that post of three weeks with a straw is the most important thing with the 30 buji. You must must be very strict, otherwise it will be very difficult. So, Sanjay, you know, we are not snug. No, I definitely believe I will become forty. I suspect if we measure it, but but we definitely not very snug on the buji. I am using thirty percent buji. Sanjay, I was quite interested with your post-op diet protocol using the the straw and liquids for three weeks. Um, have you done any? Is there any data on that? Or is that no, there is no data. But but we have been using in Homerton since I joined ten years ago, and I have, it has been working for us. So we, as I said, we haven't had a except one patient by my colleague, so we, I think they continue to use that. And that's the universal for among all of us. So the technique may vary between my colleagues, but that thing is definitely we all do for three weeks for liquid for us. And the other thing is there's a lot of interest in using tranexamic acid perioperatively in bariatric surgery patients. There's a few publications that are out. Uh, our unit is about to release a big study when I worked in Liverpool with uh, David Kerrigan. Have you had any experience in using it perioperatively for those patients who have an HP drop, which sometimes you label as hemodilution? Do you, do you think it has? Do you think it has yeah, a role? I've read through the reports while they're studying, but I'm not. We don't have. We have never used it. We we have. Richard is going to say something. Sanjay, I've got one question for you, and it's a very light-hearted question. I'm now the third generation in this uh, training lineage, so you trained me, and you've been through the hands of. Uh, Dr. Himpens and Mr. Wellborn. So just thinking about how practice changes through the generations, as it were. Do the, those other two gentlemen, do they still use drains with their sleeves? I think Dr. Dilemas, I'm sure he still uses the drains, because that's the way I learned that drain thing. Then we have more or less an estimate if something goes wrong or not. It's not always 100% accurate. Sure, but then anyway, that, that's a bit still the way we work. And also when you have the bypass, and if we leave that day until the morning, day after surgery. But, but it's more of a conservative approach, but, but it, it's not going to hurt your patient. And <coughs> we feel ourselves a bit. I think it just gives a false reassurance, but it gives a reassurance of the training. There's no blue color because they're between blue or, or a bile. Kind of got the, the other view. The other view is that bariatric surgery, modern bariatric surgery, is done according to Eras technique, that is the approach, enhances the recovery after surgery. <coughs> no laparoscopy, no pain, no use of the other techniques in the patient. I am on the Bruno and Jacques, and I totally changed because I think that without putting the drain, much lovely, it's much better. I think that when the patient goes home and you go to the lip, you might have a lip that is delayed because it's mostly self contained. If you have a drainage, 90% of that drainage is going to, to be part of. Thank you, Luigi. <laughs> Please. Do you think that it doesn't matter what color you use? I know there is science behind straight and white and we 
needs to be But every surgeon I've seen uses that kind of cartridge. Absolutely. I think so that's, that's yeah, I don't need to just standardize sleeve cartridge for which one to use, but that's what I use for the last 400 cases. But that I may be wrong, maybe you will have a different color use and that will continue to get better. Can we assume that the type of cartridge actually doesn't have much, much effect because the sleeve kits are not different overall, but everyone is using different cartridges. Uh, we need to stop at this point. Yeah. Shall we go, yeah. or shall we take a break, uh, Sanjay? <laughs> In, uh, I agree. There's no consensus on the size of uh, the type of uh, the color of the cartridge you use, but generally green and tan are being accepted. Green is what we use. However, having looked at the medical legal side, if you use a blue cartridge or anything, and there's a leak, you know, no, no leaks to stand in this country. You'll be, you'll definitely, you'll be, the lawyers will definitely get you. So, tan green is a pure some size. There's no standardization, but never go for blue. Essentially, no. Uh, we'll talk about it. Yes. You try something. Okay.